What does the scanner see? Into the head? Into the heart? Does it see into me? Clearly? Or darkly? Keanu Reeves, master air guitarist, gunfu extraordinaire, and the internet's boyfriend. <laughs> But in spite of these titles, Keanu Reeves has built up an impressive catalog of more nuanced performances that have slipped onto the radar of many moviegoers. One of these hidden gems, and one of my personal favorites, is the 2006 drug-induced sci-fi thriller A Scanner Darkly, a film with a plot as bizarre as its style of animation. For those who haven't seen A Scanner Darkly, I'm going to give a brief spoiler-free summary and describe the technique used to create it before digging into an analysis of the themes of the film. A Scanner Darkly, based on Philip K. Dick's novel of the same name, is a maze of a film that deals heavily with the complex issues of drug abuse, identity, and authoritarianism. The film takes place in a not-so-distant future where 20% of the population are addicted to a new drug called Substance D. In response, the government has developed an invasive surveillance system to crack down on the growing epidemic. Caught up in this complicated scheme is Bob Archer, an undercover cop who has become addicted to Substance D and struggles to maintain control as he unravels throughout the film. The movie stars Keanu Reeves, Robert Downey Jr., Winona Ryder, Woody Harrelson, and Rory Cochran. A Scanner Darkly was animated using a technique called interpolated rotoscoping, a method where the film is shot on a traditional camera before being fed into a vector-based program and digitally traced. Director Richard Linklater has described the resulting product as akin to a lucid dream. Traditional rotoscoping goes all the way back to 1915 when animators would trace on top of footage frame by frame. The technique has been used by various studios, but perhaps the most popularized was when Disney adopted the technique for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and many of their following classic films. Since then, rotoscoping has made its way into all sorts of popular media we see today, including Tron, the lightsabers in Star Wars, and even as part of creating Gollum for Lord of the Rings. What makes the Scanner Darkly stand out from the rest of these films is that rotoscoping was not just an effect, but it served as the main visual element in creating an immersive, drug-addled world for the viewer to get lost in. At this point, we're heading into spoiler territory, so if you haven't seen a Scanner Darkly, definitely check it out, you won't regret it, and if you do, you can yell at me in the comments. There's a lot to keep track of in this film, so let's start with the main characters. First, as I mentioned before, there is Bob Arctor, an undercover cop who goes by a few different names throughout the film. There is Donna Hawthorne, Bob's semi-love interest and drug dealer. Like Bob, we find out that she also goes by a few different names. We'll come back to that later. Then we have Bob's druggy friends who live with him. There is James Barris, who is conniving, manipulative, and strangely intellectual at times. We also have Ernie Luckman, the spacey, erratic, and lackadaisical surfer dude in the group. And then last, we have Charles Freck, the character who represents the most devastating effects of Substance D. There is some irony that his friends physically distance themselves from Freck throughout the film while ignoring that they are cognitively moving closer to becoming him. By now, you can probably tell that the most obvious theme in this film is drug abuse. In order to understand the significance of this theme, we have to first take a look at the author, Philip K. Dick. Dick considered this novel a fictionalized autobiography based on his experiences in the 1970s drug culture. After his wife left him in 1970, he coped with the emptiness of his home by letting in people off the street to live semi-communally with him. The characters we see in the movie are amalgamations of the young people in this group. For example, Donna was based on a girl with whom Dick had developed a close friendship. Bob Arthur's character stands in for Philip K. Dick himself, a man trying to keep it together but slowly falling apart. 
Dick had used amphetamines over the years to help increase his writing productivity, but during this time, he became fully dependent and stopped writing altogether. At some point during this period, his home was burglarized, which inspired a scene we see in the movie. In 1972, Dick was invited to give a speech at a science fiction convention in Vancouver. He remained in Vancouver for a short while after engaging in a brief relationship with a woman he met there. After she broke off the relationship, Dick attempted suicide. From there, he decided to go into a recovery program called Exclay, which has been described by one Philip K. Dick biographer as a de facto cult. The term Kele comes from the Northwest Native American Kwakiutl tribe, meaning path. Founder David Berner added the X and determined Exclay to mean unknown path. It was in this recovery program that Philip K. Dick formed the idea of New Path, the corrupt drug recovery foundation that treats people addicted to the same drug it secretly manufactures and distributes. One could infer that Dick may have borrowed this idea from the allegations that the CIA was involved with heroin trafficking in Laos between 1961 and 1975. In a scanner darkly, the fictional drug, Substance D, is not just a reference to heroin or amphetamines. Instead, it is a stand-in for all drugs, so that the story may apply to all people struggling with addiction, not just a select few struggling with a select drug. Substance D causes an exaggerated form of split-brain syndrome, where both halves of the brain become unaware of each other, which contributes to identity confusion, impaired cognitive functions, memory loss, and, of course, vivid hallucinations. These effects are introduced to us through the hopelessly far-gone character Charles Freck in the opening scene as he frantically struggles to wash away an endless horde of hallucinatory aphids. Later on, as he meticulously plans his suicide, including planning to be found with a copy of The Fountainhead and a half-written letter to Exxon protesting his gas card cancellation, he hallucinates an interdimensional being standing at the foot of his bed, reading him a list of his sins for all eternity. You're gonna read me my sins? Uh, it's gonna take a hundred thousand hours. We also see mania and paranoia in Woody Harrelson's character, Ernie. We witness a more sinister form of paranoia in Robert Downey Jr.'s Barris, whose veiled anxiety pushes him to connive and manipulate his group of friends so that he always feels like he's in control. At the same time, the theme of drug abuse is accompanied with a heavy dose of empathy and humanity. Philip K. Dick was intentional about detailing the effects of drug abuse, but his novel was not a big dare advertisement. Instead, through the story and the author's afterword in the novel, we see the human side of addiction and realize that the drug users in Dick's life and in the film were just people who wanted to be happy, and this was the path they chose for that fulfillment, however brief it may have been. The rise of Substance D has led to the surveillance state we see in the film. The concept of authoritarianism stems from Philip K. Dick's own theories that the government was watching him, had files on him, and was even responsible for breaking into his home and tampering with his work. It's worth noting that the book was conceived during the Nixon presidency, where distrust of the government and conspiracy theories gained validation after news of the Watergate scandal broke. In a scanner darkly, the authoritarian invasion of privacy is ever-present and in some ways eerily similar to what government agencies such as the NSA are capable of today. In Dick's story, this complex surveillance system can trace calls and through a sophisticated network of cameras, the system can almost instantly identify the people on the phone. At this point, agents can even choose whether or not to pursue the individuals or make an arrest. Constant surveillance and Bob's role on both sides of the cameras ultimately play a large part of his struggle to grasp at a sense of identity. Even without drug use, Bob Arthur is already under pressure due to being undercover. When around his superiors, he is required to wear a device called a scramble suit and assigned the name Fred to protect his identity. His boss, Hank, also wears a scramble suit to hide his identity. Unaware that Fred is Bob Arctor, Hank orders him to use the surveillance scanner to monitor Arctor and keep tabs on the house. This duality is greatly exacerbated when Bob becomes addicted to Substance D. 
The film does a great job at toying with the viewers regarding what's real and what's not so that even we aren't sure who Bob Arthur really is. For example, there's a scene where Bob thinks of his house and the potential it has. We see a flashback to a wife and a family, but we never really find out why they're gone or if they were ever really there at all. As Bob reviews the footage of himself on the scanner, his deteriorating mind causes him to dissociate from Bob and believe he is someone else. This is why near the end of the film, when Hank tells him that he is Bob Arctor, he breaks down in disbelief. Afterward, Bob starts to mentally fall apart as the effects of Substance D have caused too much damage. He is then admitted to New Path for recovery, and he is given the name Bruce, a third identity. Instead of coexisting, these identities compete for control throughout the film. As Fred, in his scramble suit, watches himself on surveillance, he forgets that he is also Bob. As Bob tangled up in drug culture, he seems to have long forgotten his identity before he went undercover. Then finally, as Bruce, he seems to have forgotten everything he used to be, as his cognitive functions are severely impaired. That being said, the most tragic part of Bob's story is that he was never in control. We find out near the end of the film that Donna Hawthorne is Hank, Bob's boss. She has been pulling the strings, arming Bob to unwittingly infiltrate New Path, which the police have begun to suspect is a corrupt organization. Donna, or as we later find out, Audrey, executes her plan masterfully, manipulating Bob and filling his head with subliminal triggers throughout the film. We find out the goal was to push Bob to the point of burning out so that he would be admitted to New Path without consciously being aware of any mission. These subliminal triggers were implanted to subconsciously guide him through his task of exposing New Path as the manufacturer and distributor of Substance D. These subliminal messages stuck with Bob despite his degradation because they were associated subconsciously with his emotions and feelings, particularly towards Donna. In one scene, Donna talks about how she wants to move north, live in a cabin on a farm, surrounded by mountains, and she hopes Bob can join her. We see later that she was describing the location Bob would be sent to after being taken in by New Path. Another major trigger coordinated by Donna was Bob's discussion with the doctors when he is told to bring Donna little blue flowers to win her over. Substance D, of course, is made from little blue flowers. Donna was successful in this mission because, unlike Bob, Donna faked using drugs while encouraging Bob to indulge. She also kept Bob at a distance by minimizing their physical interaction and blaming it on her drug use. By keeping Bob at an arm's length, she cleverly leverages control and influence over him throughout the film. Although we see Donna genuinely cares about Bob and she struggles with the guilt of knowing that she sacrificed him without his knowledge or without giving him the chance to even volunteer. But in that same scene, we find out from Mike, another agent, that New Path would not risk bringing anyone of sound mind to the farms. So the only way a person could gain access would to become so burnt out that New Path would not recognize them as a threat. That unfortunate non-threat was Bob Arctor. His mind is reduced to the point where he repeats words spoken to him as if he is hearing them for the first time. No snow, but mountains. I like mountains. The air is good here. I like air. He mindlessly follows instructions without questioning or even understanding his circumstances. He is barely conscious, but as we see in the end, Bob finds an entire field of these flowers and instinctively tucks one in his sock, thinking it would be a nice gift for his friends. Bob is blissfully unaware that he has just taken the most crucial step in finally ending the Substance D epidemic. Thanks for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos about art, entertainment, and culture.